a whole bunch of reactants and very little products, guess what happens? The reactants become products. On the other hand, if you've got a whole bunch of products and very few reactants, are the reactants going to keep reacting? No, they're going to stop. In fact, we're going to learn next in the next unit in chemical equilibrium that the products will reform the reactants. So that's the basis for equilibrium. We have multiple things going on at the same time. Now understand, PowerPoint doesn't have the equilibrium symbol. This is the best I could find. This is the equilibrium symbol. Half an arrow pointing that way, half an arrow pointing that way. So what does this mean? If you have a sample of water that is not at the boiling temperature and not, the, not, not at the freezing temperature, it's both condensing and evaporating at the same time. If you, uh, if you have a block of ice at zero degrees, it's both melting and freezing at the same time. That's equilibrium. Okay, so uh, what is the boiling temperature of water? 100 degrees Celsius. Yay! So the boiling temperature of water is at 100 degrees Celsius. And what is the freezing temperature of water? Zero degrees Celsius. Now, if you had some water at 60 degrees below the boiling temperature of water, which of these two arrows is bigger? Condensation. More of it will be condensing than evaporating. But if you got your water over 100 degrees, which of these arrows would be bigger? Evaporation. And at 100 degrees, the same. You go to Costco and you buy a bag of ice. Do they store the ice at zero degrees? No. What would be the point? If they stored the bag of ice at zero degrees, the moment you put it into the trunk of your car, you're going to get a pool of water. So they store the ice at like negative 10 or negative 15 degrees. That way, ideally, it doesn't start melting until you get into the house. But if you had some water that was at 10 degrees, you had, sorry, if you had some ice at 10 degrees, there's going to be more melting than freezing. Make sense? If you had ice at negative 5 degrees, there's going to be more freezing than melting. And at 0 degrees, you have both at the same rate. That's dynamic equilibrium. So the upside, conceptually challenging, but no bad. Hey, no bad. Okay. Give me a thumbs up if you're ready to move on. If this concept makes sense to you. Okay, a little bit of preview for chemical equilibrium. I have these, I'm going to show you these when we do chemical equilibrium next week. Right now we're just doing physical equilibrium. If you had some compounds and you made a change to the equilibrium, the universe loves to stay at equilibrium. It doesn't like changes. And in chemistry speak, we call this Le Chatelier's principle. Le Chatelier's principle tells us whatever you do to the equilibrium, I will attempt to undo, to redo the equilibrium. Le Chatelier's. Basically what John Nash did is he applied the Chatelier's principle to economics and got five million bucks. Yeah, the Nobel Prize is paid from the interest from Alfred Nobel's uh, massive fortune in creating dynamite. So basically, he was one of the richest individuals in human history because he created dynamite and he patented it and then he made it and sold it uh, during the Industrial Revolution where it turns out we kind of needed that so we could blow a hole through a mountain and get a train through. Uh, so he had this massive, massive uh, fortune and then he realized that dynamite was also going to be used to kill people, probably billions, and he got like, oh no, what can I do? So there, the interest in his fortune, the, the interest that acquired, that is that piles up an interest, that interest is siphoned off and goes to the Nobel Prize every year in uh, physics, chemistry, or is it just science? It might just be science or just branches of science, medicine, economics, and peace, but not math. There's no Nobel Prize in mathematics because Alfred Nobel's wife cheated with a mathematician. Fair enough. Pretty cool, huh? Now you know.
no one like. Uh, <laughs> okay, so if you like book definitions, uh, it works like this. A system at equilibrium will change to resist a stress at equilibrium. A system at equilibrium will resist uh, that equilibrium by making some kind of change. And what I like to think of, and I, like, I found works pretty well, remember up and over, down and two. Up and over, down and two. So when you're changing something in equilibrium, I will show you what that means. Up and over, down and two. <coughs> So a system at equilibrium, so a liquid will be in equilibrium with a vapor and a pressure. Kind of like if I just cap this off, the liquid will be in equilibrium with the vapor and there's gonna be some pressure in there. If I increase the pressure, what I'm gonna do, if I increase the pressure, is I'm gonna force the equilibrium to the liquid side. I'm going to force the vapor to condense into a liquid. Make sense? Yes. That's up and over. And I show you this in gas, and I'm going to show you again because it's fun. <laughs> I have to warm the water up again. It's not going to get the boiling, but it's going to be. So up and over states that if you increase the pressure, equilibrium will shift to reduce that stress by forcing the equilibrium to the left to the liquid side. Now, what down and two means is just the opposite. If you reduce the pressure, well, look at it. If you reduce the pressure, what are you going to create? Down and two. If you reduce the pressure, you're going to use up some of the liquid, and you're going to create some vapor to reduce that stress. So here's our liquid again. There's a little bit of vapor on top. If I reduce the pressure, then the liquid says, oh no, I have to turn into a, to a vapor to undo that stress. And then eventually, that stress will be taken into account, it'll be undone, and it'll stop boiling. It'll stop boiling when the pressure is re-equalized. Make sense? Yes? So is that why in the things no, it stays the same. Um, that's also the next thing. It's just the pressure okay. increases so much. So up and over, down and two. Now, this is chemical equilibrium. I'll just give you a plant to see. This is NO2 and N2O4 equilibrium. I'll show you this next week. If you increase the heat, what will you make more of? Yeah. You will make more NO2 at the expense of N2O4. <laughs> So the NO2 will increase and the N2O4 will decrease. Up and over. Does this idea make sense? Yes, sir. Again, a little siesta from math. We had a little oasis in the middle of the semester with no math before we go back to math. Um, but it, is, it can be conceptually challenging. All right. Two things left. We've already talked about vapor pressure. What is vapor pressure? Who can raise their hand and say, I remember what vapor pressure is? Wait, nobody? I wasted my time in chemistry. Vapor pressure. Vapor pressure is? Vapor pressure is... All liquids exert it. Vapor pressure is the tendency of a liquid to push into the gas phase. Yeah. All liquids want to be in the gas phase. It's the, phase. it's the most chaotic phase. It's like all teenagers want to be at the park kicking the football around, or at home playing Division Two. They would much rather not be at school. So if this represents, if this liquid and the little bubble on top represents students, what's keeping them in the liquid phase? The atmospheric pressure, the rules, right? The atmospheric pressure. If you take away the atmospheric pressure, then the students boil. 
Well, the no liquids should come. No, no liquids. Yeah, you take away the atmospheric pressure, you take away the rules, and the students go home and they create havoc and they, you know, they boil. Wait, so what happens if you took away the atmospheric pressure all the way In this room? Um, we boil. Sweet. Basically, um, NASA has data on this. This happened to a, an astronaut or a, a pilot, I can't remember if it's an astronaut or a pilot, but um, there was a, a valve break when he was in a pressure chamber and the pressure dropped rapidly. Um, so he, he basically, he could hear, he could hear his, uh, his tongue boil. So the, the water in his tongue started boiling and he could hear like fluids in his, in his head starting to like boil up. Did he didn't die. die though. Oh. No. Um, they were, he got, he got medical, medical care, but if you, if we, if all the atmospheric pressure in the room just disappeared, um, our eyes would pop, our tongue would boil, we'd probably have the nastiest diarrhea you've ever had. Um, so like the everything in would want to be out. Um, no, because our muscles would keep our blood from boiling. Our muscles basically are like pressure chambers, but anything that exposed to the atmosphere, um, your, your tongue, your eyes, your, your mouth, your butt would basically, everything in would, would want to come out. Eyes, so ears, mouth. That would probably work, yeah. You just close everything, or would it actually, or no, would it just... No, you'd be good. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay, so higher kinetic energy means higher rate of pressure, and we have one more thing to go over, we're almost done. So, volatile liquids. Volatile liquids are liquids that have a very high vapor pressure, usually because of the nature of their chemical compounds. They have very, very little intermolecular forces. So they, uh, they don't want to stick together. <coughs> Alcohols are like this. Ethers are like this. Oh, Most organic compounds that are volatile, they're also flammable. Yay! <laughs> I don't have any atmospheric pressure on top of me. I'm going to get into the gas phase. Woohoo! Come with me to the gas phase. And then eventually, hey, there's too many of you in the gas phase. You just stay in the liquid phase. We're already in the gas phase. So, yeah, I have a question about that. What do you think that happens all the time. Uh -huh. When he does that, it boils because you lose the pressure. Does it get closer? Does it reach that temperature? Or no. It just boils. It just boils. Yeah. Uh, it Spoils for fun. Okay, last thing. Okay, wait. While we're waiting, I have a question for you. Would this boil if it were very, very cold? Even if I take the pressure away? Yeah. yeah. Yes. No. No. Because you had to warm it up. Because the first place. So. If we Room temperature water. Wow. You'd have to take more. water. <laughs> Yeah, it's kind of, bubbles have formed, but it's not boiling. Bubbles did form, though. But uh, generally, warmer makes it easier to boil, right? Yes. So temperature is going to play a role in what phase of material is going to be. What else? Pressure. Pressure. So temperature and pressure play a role in what phase something's going to be. And then a bunch of people do some data, similar to what you're going to be doing tomorrow, and they create what's called a phase diagram. A phase diagram is a graph of temperature on the x-axis, pressure <coughs> on the y-axis, and what phase is going to exist. This is high pressure, this is low pressure, this is cold, and this is hot. So this is the phase diagram for a liquid water. Well, for water. And you know this. If you have atmospheric pressure, this is 101 kilopascals. This is one atmosphere right here. If you have one atmosphere pressure and 45 degrees, what phase is water at 45 degrees? Liquid. Warm liquid, right? Uh, at, uh, at, 20, at 20 degrees, a nice cool liquid, it's a liquid. However, at atmospheric pressure, if you drop the temperature to very, very cold, zero, negative one, negative two, what phase is the water going to be in? Solid. Solid. And at atmospheric pressure, if you drive the temperature to 200 degrees, what phase will it be? Liquid. So you just look at the temperature and the pressure, and you go, boop, oh, it's that phase. 
We're going to do an activity tomorrow about phase diagrams. Now here's the crazy thing about phase diagrams. Don't back up yet. Here's the crazy thing about phase diagrams. When you are on the line, you are in equilibrium of the two phases. Everything on this line, you have an equilibrium between liquid and vapor. Everything on this line, you have an equilibrium between solid and liquid. And everything on this line, you have an equilibrium between solid and vapor. This is an animation of some compound, and I don't know what it is. Some compound at the triple point. At the triple point, these lines come together and all three phases exist at the same time. There's a rolling uh, change between boiling and melting and, and uh, re-solidifying and sublimating and deep deposition. There's condensation, evaporation, melting, freezing, uh, deposition, sublimation, all happening. All six phases are happening kind of at the same time. They happen in alternating uh, times, but that's what's happening. It's freezing, then it's sublimating, then it's melting, then it's evaporating, and it's all happening. Is that triple point of nitrogen? No. The video for triple point of nitrogen is one thing I have on YouTube, but the bell's ringing in two minutes, so I don't have time to do it. Okay, questions before you pack up? Okay. I'm sorry, I can't hear you.